This episode of Trifles is brought to you by listeners like you, who choose to support us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. Go to patreon.com slash trifles to learn more. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, there were men that were dancing, creeping, and crooked. But there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutiae? What's a tantalus? Or a gasogene? And what's the difference between a handsome cab and a four-wheeler? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 368, The Other Border. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we get into the minutia of the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, are you are you busy boarding these days? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's very important that we close our borders because if they remain open, what happens is in the middle of the night the borders go down to the fridge and they eat all the scones. <laughs> that's who's been eating my egg salad yes i exactly knew it right. yeah there you are i knew it yeah. well uh this is uh the third episode of the month and in season eight that means we are reverting to our uh, tried and true series of episodes that we call mr sherlock holmes the theorist where we take a piece of old sherlockian scholarship and resurrect it and chat about it These are pieces that may or may not be mainstream, uh, but they have played into this hobby around Sherlock Holmes, and they do tend to um, investigate or touch various uh, aspects of the Sherlock Holmes stories. So we are continuing in that spirit in Season 8. Just a reminder, if you're not yet subscribed to us on whatever platform you happen to be listening to us on, hit that subscribe or follow button right now. We'd be delighted to have you as part of that. And of course, feel free to join our Patreon community, patreon.com slash trifles, or just at a link in the show notes of the app you are following us on now. Over at Patreon, we've got additional content. We have Well, I was going to say we have ad-free shows for our Patreon community. We have ad-free shows, period, right now, as we are between sponsors. Uh, If you know someone who is uh, would be a good sponsor for Trifles, please do let us know. But otherwise, uh, your support on Patreon helps keep us going. And we do have some thank you gifts at various levels there. So for as little as a dollar a month, you can be part of that community. And hopefully, within the next uh, months ahead... We'll be introducing the community chat aspect there as well. So stay tuned for that. Well, this episode of uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, a theorist, where we look at a piece of old scholarship, it's an interesting one. It's not one that um, uh, I had anticipated before. Uh, It's one that I really stumbled across. As we open uh, 221B, Studies in Sherlock Holmes, which was edited by Vincent Sterrett in 1940. Now, there's a whole variety of essays in this book, and we've talked about some of them uh, before. Dr. Watson's Secret by Christopher Morley. Uh, Was Sherlock Holmes an American? Also by Morley. Uh, We covered various aspects of Sherlock Holmes and music in previous episodes, uh, but this one, this one, I have to say, Bert, um, it, it, it took me a little while to get into and to figure out exactly what was going on. Uh, this is The Other Border by James Ketty, 
Now, James Ketty was a Bostonian. He was the founder of the Speckled Band of Boston, which is one of the oldest scion societies of the Baker Street Irregular. And um, this is, uh, I think, just a little different from what we're used to in these uh, pieces of scholarship. It's very different. And we were both remarking before we began recording about the fact that we neither one of us have paid much attention at all to this um, particular bit of scholarship, which is odd because of, you know, we both revere James Ketty and so on. And as you pointed out, it's, you know, can be found in a um, a fundamental book here, Vincent Starrett's 221B Studies in Sherlock Holmes. But part of the reason why you keep going past it is because of the way it begins. The whole thing just seems like a mystery. The other border by James Ketty, the first paragraph is, we come now to the mystery of the other border at 221B Baker Street. We know a good deal else about him, but we do not know his name. We know that he was brought into the world by a certain Dr. James Winter, who also took care of him during his infancy. Dr. Winter vaccinated the other boarder, opened an abscess for him, and blistered him for mumps. Now, that's the first paragraph. And when you read that, you say, Huh? <laughs> what? What? You know, you, it, it's kind of like finding the, the American part of Study in Scarlet. You know, you close mm. the book, you look at the spine, you say, you look at the page before, <laughs> you say, What? What is all this about? And then it goes on. You know, we hear about Dr. Winter, who must have been a remarkable man. And then suddenly we're talking about another doctor, Dr. Patterson. And, you know, it's just a, you know, I, I guess over the years I've just said, uh-huh, and moved on in the book. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, great episode. But, but, Thanks for being but here. For, yes, but friends, <laughs> we're going to be telling you the mystery. <laughs> We're going to be solving this mystery for you so you don't have to worry about it when you look at 221B and you read this this uh, this bit by Kitty. Yeah, it, it really pays off to stick with it. It's kind of like one of those old Paul Harvey rest of the story things or, or a Twilight Zone episode where, you know, as we make our way through it, suddenly our senses are opened up and we realize exactly what's going on here. Well, it's it's indicative of a couple of things. I mean, first of all, you can assume, because nobody who is putting out a book is in the business of mystifying a readership, you can assume that the cognoscenti or the people who uh, put this book together and who acquired it and read it and so on had a sense of what Ketty was talking about that's probably been lost in the ages. And in fact, you, you, you can put the thing together yourself because it, when you... If you wander through this little piece by Ketty's, you eventually find out that this refers to a story that was originally collected in a series of short stories by Arthur Conan Doyle called Round the Red Lamp. And the Round the Red Lamp, the Red Lamp was the historical symbol for a doctor in a community. There was a, a red glass, um, you know, around around the lamp, and so you could always find the doctor's office. It was uh, it was a you know a place to go in case of a medical emergency, and so Conan Doyle used that name, Round the Red Lamp, for a series of basically medical stories. And there is a story in that volume. It's the first one called Behind the Times, and there you get immediate relief because the first sentence of that story, Behind the Times, is. My first interview with Dr. James Winter was under dramatic circumstances. And that tells you, aha, okay, at least here we're talking about Dr. Winter. Yeah, and um, Conan Doyle continues with it. It occurred at two in the morning in the bedroom of an old country house. I kicked him twice on the white waistcoat and knocked off his gold spectacles. <laughs> While he, with the aid of a female accomplice, stifled my angry cries in a flannel petticoat and thrust me into a warm bath. Well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, now, eventually, you're going to find out that Ketty has done something real clever here. But, but there are some lovely little things along the way. So as you get into this little short story, Behind the Times, 
by Arthur Conan Doyle. It's a reminiscence by this unknown narrator. And it's this unknown narrator, marin, <laughs> unknown marinator, the un- unknown narrator that um, Ketty is referring to as the other border at 221B. But along the way, there's some lovely little bits of writing here. For example, the narrator uh, is reminiscing about Dr. Winter, and what's happened in the interval is that the narrator himself has become a medical man. His hair is a little wider. We're talking now about Dr. Winter. The huge shoulders a little more bowed. He's very tall. He loses a couple of inches from his stoop. That big back of his has curved itself over sick beds until it has at last set in that shape. How old he is, I could never discover. And there's wonderful paragraphs here describing this this old man, Dr. Winter, and a particular n- n- nice line he has here. He says, the narrator says, his mind must have been open to impressions very early, but it must also have closed early, for, for the politics of the day have little interest for him, while he is fiercely excited about questions which are entirely prehistoric. He shakes his head when he speaks of the first reform bill, expresses grave doubts as to its wisdom, and I've heard him, when he was warmed by a glass of wine, say bitter things about Robert Peel and his abandoning of the corn laws. (laughs) So, you know, we go on in in that way for a while, and we find out that this dear Dr. Winter you know, is very much almost, uh, you know, an 18th century um, kind of character, although still revered, which is uh, really what this story is all about, how this old medical practitioner is, uh, even though he doesn't believe in germs, he doesn't, he doesn't believe in uh, um, any of the modern science. Um, <laughs> but even so... The narrator says, we made him president of our branch of the British Medical Association, <laughs> but he resigned after the first meeting. <laughs> and, and here we come into contact with another doctor, Dr. Patterson. And mm. Ketty tells us Patterson was, a, uh, was contemporaneous with the other border, capital O, capital B. Mm. Yet it was Dr. Winter uh, who... Uh, invited out of courtesy to watch a delicate operation on Sir John Surwell, saved their reputations for these young men by stepping in where they had failed and bringing the operation to a successful issue. Dr. Winter had received Dr. Patterson and the other boarder most cordially when they settled into his neighborhood, but the patient's reception had been less warm. Influenza broke out. Uh, One morning I met Patterson on my round, writes the other boarder, and found him Looking rather pale and fagged out, he made the same remark about me. So both doctors had come down with influenza. And it was of Patterson, naturally, that I thought, continues the other boarder. But somehow the idea was repugnant to me. I thought of his cold, critical attitude. I wanted something more soothing, something more genial. Hmm. Mrs. Hudson, said I to my housekeeper, Would you kindly run along to old Dr. Winter and tell him I should be obliged to him if he would step around? And she was back with her answer presently. Dr. Winter will come around in an hour or so, but he's just been called in to attend Dr. Patterson. (laughs) (laughs) And that's it. That's the end of this Conan Doyle story behind the times about this really out-of-touch elderly doctor whom they both revere and who these two young physicians call upon when they themselves are ill. You know, that's, that's the whole point. But Ketty says, wow, you know, what is going on here? Mrs. Hudson? So what's the connection between the unnamed other boarder and Dr. Patterson and Dr. Winter and 221B Baker Street? Ketty says, um, first of all, we must be sure that it was at 221B Baker Street that the mysterious surgeon, whom we must still call the other boarder, had Mrs. Hudson for his housekeeper. We must approach this question with caution, because much more than the identity of the other boarder depends upon our findings. 
And Keddie has written this whole, his whole essay here very conversationally. He says, remember, my dear fellow, to the reader, see, he's talking to you. We do not know that Mrs. Hudson was even in charge at 221B Baker Street when Holmes and Watson took rooms there at the time of the dark incidents of the study in Scarlet, because the housekeeper's name is not mentioned in Watson's narrative. Mrs. Hudson, our landlady, comes out of her anonymity at the time of the shocking affair at Pondicherry Lodge. That's the sign of four, which ended so romantically for Watson. Sometime later... March 1888, according to a scandal in Bohemia, we know that Mrs. Hudson had been supplanted as our housekeeper at 221B by a Mrs. Turner. Hmm. Now, that's, that's fascinating because we think we know Mrs. Hudson, you know, who, who seemingly came with the furniture, with, with, with the building itself uh, at 221B. And yet, uh, Kenny makes a very astute observation. Our assumptions uh, can be colored by our knowledge of the rest of the the 60 stories in that very first one. In a study in Scarlet, we don't know the name of the housekeeper uh, or the landlady. Mm. And, and she does receive her that name in a sign of four, but immediately reverts back to uh, another one, Mrs. Turner. There have been theories about Mrs. Turner over the years. Could it have been Mrs. Hudson's sister? Uh, our friend, you know, perhaps Mrs. Hudson was on holiday at the time. Mm. Um, so, so this is very astute by Ketty to uh, draw in this inference about Mrs. Hudson. Mm. Yeah, fascinating. And Ketty, um, you know, closes the whole thing off. He says, well, you know, basically he says we could assume, but we can't prove it, that Conan Doyle, who knew Watson intimately, although he did not seem to fully understand him, recommended the other boarder to Mrs. Hudson. It's highly probable that he saw him there when he called at 221B. Perhaps it was there that he heard the gently amusing and faintly pathetic anecdote behind the times, which gives us our sole clue to the other boarder's existence. Undoubtedly, and for literary effect, he retold the story in the first person just as he had heard it. Well, doubtless, time and the deliberation of the scholar will eventually disentangle every knot in Baker Street history. So that's so. <laughs> Ketty just sort of throws it back over the transom to you. Uh, I appreciate his optimism at the end, <laughs> <laughs> but it's lovely, you know, because his audience at the time, um, you you can presume that they were not all scratching their heads and saying, "What is this guy talking about?" Uh, folks who were perhaps more intimately familiar with the works of Conan Doyle and this particular anecdote than, than we in the um, 21st century. Well, it uh, remains as a curiosity to us today, and as always, it's just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Now that was something a little recherchy.